Mm -hmm. He's so cute. Until he comes to my leg. <laughs> All right, are you ready? Mm -hmm. All right, cool. <laughs> I don't even know, but you're on film now, so okay. you don't have to pose or anything. Okay, cool, cool. What's your name? My name is like Libby Cole. I was like, what? <laughs> What's my name? What's my name? Libby Cole. Okay, and how old are you? I am 34. Okay. So, Libby, who are you on a soul level? Um. Well, I guess that I am can be somewhat of a paradox. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely have different sides to me and sometimes I show up as one person and sometimes I show up as another person. Um, but <laughs> I am pretty empathetic and compassionate mm -hmm. and what else? Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm creative but I don't think of myself as an artist, but I like to be around that and have some component of that. But then the other side of me is more analytical. Mm -hmm. So kind of, yeah, split personality. So is there anything that's happened to you in the past or anything that's going on right now that has made you this person or that really contributes to who you are today? Um, yeah, absolutely. I don't have any major major trauma or events, but, um, you know, I've always felt a little bit, I've always been in the mix, but a little bit outside, never felt super comfortable in my skin. I moved from Maine to Maryland when I was 10. And even though that is not a, a huge move, it's not cross country, it's not international. Um, I felt like that was kind of made me different. And through the years, I think I've realized that that didn't make me different. It just, I, that's what I pointed to. Cause it was at 10 years old, which is kind of pivotal. That's where you start to develop a social sense and kind of be more self-aware. Um, I had a good relationship with my father, but it was also very tumultuous. So um, he actually died in 2014. He had been sick for 10 years. He had cancer twice and then was diagnosed with late onset multiple sclerosis. So he was really sick and it was hard to watch. I was in New York and he was in Florida. So um, I was constantly like going back and forth to take care of him. And then he died in a car accident. So it was very, even though we were prepared knowing he was sick and we had talked a lot about his passing on, it was still very sudden. Um, and I think I saw it as a blessing because he had been in so much pain and it took me a while to actually grieve because it was sort of this relief um, since he had been in so much pain. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I've had, um, you know, I have some personal struggles. I am bipolar too and was diagnosed with that when I was about 16. And I had an eating disorder before that um, and then substance abuse. So that has been a long road that has, um, you know, had a lot of self learning and a lot of struggles and also a lot of realization that I'm not that special and unique and that there's plenty of people who have had it far worse and struggle far worse than I do. And it's stuff that we don't talk about. Uh, I don't know if you could even tell how I hesitated to say any of those things. Um, to put it out there, but I do like to be open about it and you know, it's really It is different than having Diabetes or a medical thing, but at the same time, it's not and it's just something that's stigmatized in our society So there's that Thank you for sharing that um, There's going to be three categories which you may or may not know but I want you to tell me what takes the front seat in your life or means the most to you and then what make, means the least to you and we're gonna like go down okay. the list. So um, 
The first is love, sex, relationships. The next is society, culture, politics. And then the third is spirituality and or religion. So what is most important to you out of those things? I would say that it's definitely changed over time. Um, increasingly, spirituality is becoming most important to me. Uh, and then love, sex, relationships, and then society and culture. And before, you know, growing up, I would have said probably love, sex, relationships, society, culture, and then spirituality last. Okay. So what does your spirituality look like? Like, what does that look like for you now since it's most important? It is pretty undefined. It's not religion. Mm -hmm. um, it is kind of finding a connection with myself and my own feelings and, and not just blowing over those, but kind of addressing them. And then finding a connection with the universe at large and kind of like the greater power. Um, I call it my higher power just as a term. Um, you know, I don't really know what that looks like or what it means but I know that there's something out there that is greater than myself. And I, when I open my eyes, I really see that take a place in the role, uh, take a place in my life and showing up and, you know, what we might call coincidences or um, just situations I find myself in, people that have come into my life and the story of my life, the way it's kind of unfolded. Um, I can't deny that there is something larger at play besides a bunch of atoms crashing into each other. Yes. <laughs> okay, so the next is love, sex, relationships. So tell me your thoughts as like a millennial in this time on like love, sex, relationships. You've been in love before, like do you have advice? Where are you at right now? Like just what are your thoughts on dating, so, love, and sex? And that's definitely somewhere right now that I'm figuring out kind of again. Um, I have been in love before and it can be really challenging and I hate the saying that sometimes love isn't enough, but I think there's so many things that go into, so many factors that go into love and relationships. They're so complicated and you can love someone and it still may not be the right situation for one or both of you. Um, and it also takes work. so. You know, just showing up every day isn't enough. You have to be thoughtful. You have to be considerate of your own needs and the other person's needs. And they have to do the same thing if it's gonna work. Okay. So what about um, sex? Sex. I love sex. Um, I used to think that I was like very open-minded and very liberal. Um, I don't think I am as liberal as I thought I was compared to the continuum that's opened up in society. I, I could never be in a polyamorous relationship. That's great for people, for other people. Like I don't judge that, I'm not against it, but I can never imagine myself. I'm much more traditional, I'm heterosexual. Um, you know, I wanna be in a monogamous relationship with a man, but um, I do you know, believe in being open about sex. Um, I find myself in lots of really funny conversations talking about people, and I love that it's not as taboo as it was years ago. Yeah, seriously. So, last society, culture, you didn't even put politics in your society, culture. You were just like society and culture. <laughs> well, so I, can't, like, I can't just like reiterate everything. I'm not... No, yeah, no, I knew you funny. know what I mean. So. Yeah, no, but... So, what are your thoughts on politics? Uh, like, so are you political? Do you even like know what's happening? Do you know who's running? Like, yes, okay. I do. I'm not super political. Like, I don't, I, I don't pay attention to the primaries okay. because I get very jaded and think um, it's just a total shit show. And then there is that part of me that like, um, I don't even know if I'm registered as a Democrat now because I used to refuse to go to one party or the other. I think that the by part of by bipartisan politics is so flawed because we get polarized and if you believe in this and you're a Republican then you have to believe in this and if you believe in this and you're Democrat then you have to believe in this as opposed to seeing everything on a continuum mm -hmm. um, and to be able to really 
make choices and effects and for politicians to, to have their own views. But um, someone put it to me, so I used to, you know, say I was an independent and someone put it in terms to me that like, whether or not you think that that's the best system, that's our system and you gotta show up and play, so you gotta pick a team. Mm -hmm. And um, while I still struggle with that a little bit, there are things that are associated with the conservative party that I can't get on board with. Um, and that's mostly has to do with tolerance for minorities and um, gay and lesbian. And I just, I feel like there's, there's too much. I'm not saying every Republican is racist or hateful, but there's so much of that that has become entwined with that. I can't, I just can't go there. Yeah. And so I'm much more socially liberal. Okay. What are your thoughts on our society? That's tricky. I mean, some of it's beautiful. Some of it's rough. I think that we tend to, as a, as a whole mass, I think, I kind of, I love people individually. I tend to not love the masses. Um, I think that there's so much group think and people just get so overboard. So like I use social media, but I also think it's ridiculous. Like I have friends that take lots and lots of selfies and it drives me crazy. It just, mm. But it's also, that's what it is now. And, and so, you know, maybe I'm, I am a millennial technically, but I'm an older millennial. So maybe that's just not part of my experience growing up. Like I grew up on instant messenger. I didn't mm. grow up with Instagram. Facebook was not around until my sophomore year of college. Mm. So I've had, I've lived with and without all of these things. And so sometimes I find it to be just really draining <laughs> how much, um, how much time and energy it can take and and how some of it can feel very self-absorbed. But then again, that's my judgment. You know, I can't take a selfie for my life. Like I hate every selfie I take, so I don't post them. Okay, so <laughs> I'm gonna get you to pick colors that represent you. Everything that makes you happy, everything that maybe reminds you of something in your life. Just any color that's like super important or makes you feel something. Um, and then I'm gonna get, get you to draw for the rest of the interview. So I just want you to pick colors and then explain like why you pick the specific colors. How many you can colors? pick as many as you want. I've had somebody literally say, can I keep all of them? That's awesome. Yeah. Also, can you tell everyone your ethnicity, by the way, for the culture part? Just because I feel like a lot of people are going to be like, what is she? Because you can yeah. pass for her. I can pass for a lot. A people lot of different think things. I'm a lot of things. Um, I am, I like to tell people I'm a wasp because that totally shocks them and that's not what they expect. I am English, Scottish. My grandmother came through Ellis Island from Finland, um, a tiny bit of French. And we found out recently from my cousin doing one of the DNA tests that there is some Spanish in our background. Um, I look like my family, but they don't look like me, if that makes sense. So my mom and I have very similar bone structures, mm. mannerisms, all of that, but I'm just much darker than the rest of my family. Mm. Um, and my grandmother that came in from Finland, she was not blonde hair, blue eyes. Mm. She was a little bit darker. So. Um, whether that goes back to Spanish or um, the Moors or Russian, we're not sure, but she definitely came from Helsinki. Mm. But yeah, my aunt's redhead. My brother is dark hair, but he's much fairer than I am. Um, people think my mom and I look like a positive negative mix. So <laughs> I've been always, always, always asked. Um, when, my, when I was born actually, my dad went home to change clothes and there was a shift in the nurses, like between their schedule. And so they came in and saw my mom and saw me and went through like, oh, is your husband Hispanic? Is he black? Is he Russian? Is he Greek? And, you know, went through uh, like guessing everything. Um, That's so funny. Anytime I travel, people speak, well, even, even 
locally people start speaking Spanish to me and I have to be like, no hable. I had someone call me an American bitch and say that they knew I spoke Spanish but was refusing because I didn't want to talk to them. Um, and then for eight years, I dated a black man. And so when I would be with him or his family, people were really confused. But I am just a straight up white girl. <laughs> Word. <laughs> what, what colors did you pick? So I picked, I mean, I knew the first thing was going to be green. I picked three shades of green to turquoise. Uh, my favorite color has been... Um, well, when I was a little girl, I loved pink and purple, but then it went straight to green. I love nature. It just feels really fresh, um, really crisp, and I always gravitate towards green. And then a raspberry, I wish these had names on them, kind of like a raspberry pink. Um, as much as I try not to be a girly girl, I absolutely am. And it also just always looks nice with the green. Yes. And this sort of cerulean blue, which reminds me of the sky. Mm. And then just a lavender for fun and black because I pretty much ground everything in black. Sweet. Yeah. So I'm going to get you to draw on this. And it doesn't matter what you draw. Don't stress yourself out too much. Just draw whatever makes your heart happy. And then at the end, you'll show everyone. Okay. Okay. So first question, what makes you the most upset? What really pisses you off? So what pisses me off or makes me upset? Because upset, I think of sad, but okay. anger is a different thing. Let's start with pisses off and then we'll go to sad. Okay, so um, I really don't like when people can be inconsiderate, intolerant, or hateful. That gets me really angry. Um, I hope I don't say um too much. It's fine. And yeah, that's definitely the number one is when I see people be intolerant or cruel, um, especially to someone who may be struggling and mm -hmm. they don't know. Okay. So what about what makes you upset? Like sad, I guess. What makes me sad is I'm very sensitive. Um, and I'm not always in tune with that. So a lot of times I get sad and I don't know why. And it usually, you know, it's some underlying emotion that I haven't addressed. And it could be like, I get sad a lot. It's been five years since my dad died and I still get really sad about that. Um, and when, uh, insecurity. I get very sad about my own insecurity and I don't want to be and I try to fight it. But I think that definitely takes a toll on me. Mm -hmm. Is that a, or are you thinking? That's it. Okay. What are you insecure about? Everything. Um, I always, I've never ever thought of myself as a perfect person, but yet I always, I guess want to be mm. and and I don't I don't it's not that I want to be perfect it's just that I want to I hold I give myself high standards and high expectations um if there's something Same. I'm not good at I'm probably not gonna do it like um when I was younger I wasn't good at soccer but a lot of the pool girls played soccer and I would just watch and be like man if I could play soccer then I would be able to hang out with the guys more because they all play soccer together. Mm. Um, or, you know, definitely the way I look. I've been told my whole life that I'm attractive, but I don't always think that myself. And then there's also this pressure that I always have to like look the best, mm. be the most. Um, if I'm in a conversation with people like political, for example, like I said, I. I do have political thoughts, but I don't know everything. I don't, I rarely, I try to read the news and I generally know what's going on in the world, but I'm not up on like the day to day and mm. policies. And so if I'm in a conversation with intelligent people who really know what they're talking about, I just start to feel like, wow, I'm such an idiot. I should pay more attention to this world. Mm. Okay. What are some pet peeves of yours? Uh, minivans. 
Okay. When people are inconsiderate driving. Um, when people can't read the room. Mm. So, you know, if they're talking and everyone else is clearly either not comfortable or not interested in what they're saying or when they go on and speak for way too long mm. that drives me crazy uh, i think that's like i became aware of that when i was in my first job and my boss it was in a sales position and my boss would be pushing things and i could tell the client was getting irritated mm. um and it would just drive me crazy like move on right don't sabotage this appointment <laughs> word okay what are you most afraid of? Um, I think being alone, whether that's actually physically being alone or, and like dying alone or just feeling alone in my own head. Mm. What? makes you really excited? Like what makes you really happy? When things just come together and laughing, for sure. Be, you know, connecting with people. Um, sometimes I isolate, which is weird because people think of me as extremely social. Yes. But I do isolate and I am actually mm -hmm. really shy sometimes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'm not, but so people are always very surprised by that when I say it but you know when when I'm open and in a good mood or even if I'm not sometimes it puts me in a good mood but just mm -hmm. connecting with people and feeling that connection and that energy and being able to laugh and have a good time and um you know and and doing doing good things helping others yeah is really rewarding I can definitely relate to that shy thing. Anytime I tell someone I'm shy, they're like, shut up, no, you're not. Yeah. And I'm like, what? Like, I know how terrified I feel right now. Yeah, so. because I'm very aware of, not aware, that's not the right word, uh, very concerned with what other people think of me. Mm -hmm. And I can make that up in my head and I can wonder, like, well, am I good enough? What do they think of me? Right. What did I just say? Was that annoying? Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes I can... I just have no, I've developed a filter over the years. It's gotten a lot better. I used to have absolutely no filter for what I said mm. and, um, you know, worry about offending people or crossing the line because I just blurt things out. Yeah. Okay. Make a face that explains you. Like if you were a facial expression, what would it be? And if you can't make the face, then what's like the emoji that would be you? So probably smile because generally I am pretty happy. Um, and that's definitely what everyone thinks about me is that, you know, I'm smiling and bubbly that, so smile. Okay. <laughs> Do you have any vices? Yes. What are they? Um, so I picked up smoking, kind of, I've not always been a smoker, but I picked up smoking and I hate that and it feels it makes me feel like a disgusting human and it's also just very unhealthy. Uh, and caffeine for sure. Mm. And attention. Yeah. <laughs> I feel that. What is the hardest conversation you've had to have? Or one of them if you can't like complain in your entire life. Uh Probably one of, well, one of them would be breakup conversations where I've had um, the experience of loving someone and knowing that it wasn't, it wasn't the right relationship, the right time and having to break up and being very conflicted about it mm -hmm. and um, needing to be clear and I'm not you know, when it comes to men and relationships, I'm not good at being clear or drawing boundaries uh, or making those definitive decisions. Okay. Another one would be some of the conversations I'd had with my dad. As an adult, um, as it became, he was sick both mentally and physically and having to kind of become the parent 
and and that was really difficult to have to you know go from where you think you're in this relationship and the dad's supposed to be the caretaker and he's supposed to have all the advice and all the answers and I you know suddenly I was parenting him and trying to help him and he just by nature could be very resistant and argumentative and so trying to keep my cool um, there was one I remember just shaking and him asking me for something and me saying absolutely not um, and he tried to you know say why why wouldn't you give this to me like don't you love me mm -hmm. and that was really hard and he was you know he was sick yeah. he was not in a good place that's not who he was as a person right but that was the situation we were in and it was really upsetting yeah thank you for sharing that um do you have any weird habits oh sure i talk to my dog a lot um i sometimes i said sleep is really important to my mental health and sometimes i like love staying up late or all night and i know that's bad but i just love that feeling of i think it's kind of the rest of the world is shut off there's no demands there's no distractions and it just becomes my time so i'm a big weirdo in the middle of the night <laughs> um, you know i play music i sing i do random stuff like maybe i'll even clean who knows but it just feels like a really safe time for me mm. I like that. What is the craziest thing you've ever seen in your life? The craziest thing I've ever seen in my life? Yeah. In person. The craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. And if you haven't, like, seen anything crazy, then it's, like, the craziest situation you've ever been in where you were just like, is this happening? <laughs> like, I can't believe that I'm like witnessing this right now and like in this situation. I mean, the first thing that popped into my mind, I don't think this is even what you mean by this question, but um, I had the privilege of watching the sunset in Ia, which is Northern Santorini in Greece. And it was this amazing moment. It's supposed to be like the, the best sunset in the world. Mm -hmm. And so there's this amazing sunset and you're looking out on the ocean and there's all these houses and, um, and like levels and you see all these people come and there were there was some um, Red Bull team there doing, I guess, parkour, but flips from house to house. And it was just this amazing, crazy thing. I mean, that's pretty that's insane. Crazy. Yeah. So that answers was, my question perfectly. Striking. Number one, I'm pretty sure most people haven't witnessed that. And number two, now everybody probably wants to. So. Um, and then, like, in a totally different vein, I saw this guy getting ready to like hit his girlfriend on the subway and in New York yeah and my ex grabbed him told the girl to get off at the next stop and held this guy until the next stop so he could not hurt her and the guy like didn't try to hurt your ex-boyfriend he just like was, was like oh, that's fine you can he hold was me. overpowered there was no contest okay <laughs> <laughs> what happened when he finally let him go and the girl had gotten off or whatever like did he just get off at the next stop and not say anything to your ex or? Yeah, I mean, I think he had like a couple words for him, but he was pretty scared yeah. and and shocked. And, you know, who knows what happened, if she went back to him, if they got in contact. Like, right. I would like to think that she was safe and got help, but um, in those, you know, if that was a true domestic abuse situation, like, you never know. Right. It can be hard to leave. This is going to be a very open-ended question, but what do you need to heal? Um, I mean, I think self-forgiveness. I have all the resources. Like, I'm very blessed. I have all the resources I can need. I have all the love in the world uh, from family and friends. And I think it's just continued or improved diligence, taking care of myself, um, like that whole sleep thing, and and self forgiveness and self love is probably what I'm lacking the most. Hmm. What's missing?
that self love. Okay, so I give everybody the same question at the end of all of the interviews, and it's like all of the electricity goes out, but the phone, the computer, and the TV screen stay on, and it's like PSA, public service announcement, and then it's your face and everybody in the world can see your face. What are you gonna say? What are you gonna do? Um, urge everyone to take a few deep breaths and stay calm and treat each other with respect because I feel like in those situations, people get desperate and act like animals and and like hurt each other and loot and take advantage of the situation. So I would just hope that, you know, we keep each other safe. Okay. And in a situation that's not necessarily an emergency, if you had the chance to speak to the entire world, what would you say? Have more tolerance. Is the, Has there ever been a situation that you've been in that you, and I interviewed someone else that said that they wanted to know these things um, from like every person, all races. And I thought it was really interesting. Have you ever been in a situation where you know you were treated differently because of how you look? So that can be like, because you're white or because you're pretty, like whatever. Like, have you ever been in a situation where- Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I volunteer with uh she's not a youth anymore she's like 22 or 20 um oh. but she's black and i've been in a lot of situations where and i try to coach her because she's not always super polite but like coach her to say you know ask please thank you you'll get farther than that but there's lots of times where she'll go try to get information or find something out like one time she was trying to find out where the school things were at walmart and got you know ignored and then i walk up and get an answer tolerance <laughs> people need it yeah okay well yeah thank you so much for doing this yeah thank you i think you did great thanks it's really nerve-wracking yeah <laughs> it's like you can't prepare for it and you're put on the spot to, to talk about things that you know it's like real shit but you don't necessarily think about yeah, but you did great. Show everybody what you drew. What did you draw? It's so stupid. <laughs> um, it's just like it's some cute. flowers and leaves. You know, just like the colors go in nicely together. Can you sign it? I sure can. This is Libby in the flesh.